Warning, this episode deals with racially aggravated crime, torture and the murder of a young boy under the age of 16. Listener discretion is advised. Pollock Shields is a historic area of Glasgow, lying in the south side of the city, bordered by its larger neighbours, Govan Hill and Shawlands. It was established by the famous Stirling Maxwell family sometime in 1849, and over time, many of Glasgow's greatest and most exciting architects contributed buildings and housing design for its growing population. The luxury villas and tenements which they designed created an upmarket and luxurious Victorian feel to the area, which remains to this day. The area had initially operated as an independent township or borough, however, the local powers elected to cede control of the area to the city of Glasgow in the early 1890s. With the power of the then Glasgow Corporation behind Pollock Shields, the area blossomed. By the 1950s, immigration was in full swing across the United Kingdom, and Glasgow was no exception. With the partition of the Punjab region between Pakistan and India, many of the inhabitants left in search of a better way of life. Initially, many of these families settled in the Gorbals, where the Glasgow Corporation had set about creating sufficient housing to meet the demand. More and more families arrived throughout the 60s and 70s. They set up independent businesses, joined the Glasgow buses as bus drivers and conductors, and many brought medical certification over to work within the NHS. Over time, a number of these families became dissatisfied with the Gorbals and the standard of housing available to them. Starting their own families and giving them room to flourish required more space than the cramped flats which the corporation had made available to them. The spacious villas and tenements of Pollock Shields became attractive propositions and they moved in alongside their then predominantly white neighbours. Any period of assimilation between two groups has the potential to create tension. With the already established white community feeling their status in the area was being threatened by the incoming Asian families, there were gangs formed and these gangs then had running battles with others. The gangs were primarily composed of males in their teens and early twenties, and formed part of the broader Glasgow youth gang culture. These gangs, often referred to as young teams, group up with other boys from their area and around their age group and go into opposing gangs territory. Once there, they seek out the young team from that area and attempt to turn them over in their own backyard using bricks, bottles, fists and knives. The young team on their own territory needs to fight the other side off, or suffer taunts and loss of face. In many ways, the system operates as somewhat of a training school for the adult gangland, toughening up youngsters from the area who then may progress out of the youth gangs into crime as a profession. Youths who are not affiliated with a gang are typically not targets for targeted gang violence. It is somewhat of a self-contained phenomenon whereby bystanders may get hurt, but it is far more likely that those involved are at risk. In certain areas, the gangland divisions are drawn internally within areas. That is to say, one area of the city may have subdivisions within it, all controlled by different gangs. Easter House, a notoriously tough suburb in Glasgow's East End, has well over 10 groups fighting over only 4 square miles, whereby the division often gets drawn by where one housing estate begins and another ends. Pollock Shields was not however divided by territory, but by heritage. Across an area of less than one square mile, boys from white backgrounds battled with boys from Asian backgrounds for nothing more than reputation and to let people know where the lines of power lay. This split in the youth was somewhat mirrored in the adult community. There was the white Scottish community of Pollock Shields and there was the Asian diaspora community of Pollock Shields. As one former gang member, 
known during his time associated with the Young Shields gang as Minta, noted to Asian Image in 2006. In Pollock Shields, the doctors, dentists and accountants you go to are all Asian. You eat and shop at Asian businesses. Unless you go to the city centre, you will not interact with a Scottish person. The same could be said for the white community within the area. There was no act of boycotting of Asian-led or Scottish-led businesses by the other community. It was just a faint cultural line most did not cross. Over time, some degree of assimilation did take place with a transference of friendship, culture, food and stories amongst the two groups. However, on occasion, the division between the communities would bubble ferociously again. By the late 1990s, one gang group stood out above the rest. The Shielders. Imran Shahid led them, an Asian youth who had close cropped hair which he dyed blonde. As a result of this hairstyle, he was nicknamed Baldy. He had a bull strong physique, proudly boasting of having a 50 inch chest measurement and a nature which was feared across Pollock Shields and beyond. He had left a man with brain damage in a baseball bat attack and had chopped off the finger of a rival to send a message to the gangland community. With the support of his brother Zishan, nicknamed Crazy, the gang's second in command, most preferred to walk on the other side of the road if they saw the pair or their entourage approaching. The Shielders had waged war on the inhabitants of their area from their teens until their early twenties and opposition to their antics and crimes were scarce. Eventually, their grip of fear and terror on Pollock Shields made it impossible for them to live there as well as control it. Baldy Shahid had spent time in jail for attempted murder in the mid-90s and had just finished 30 months in prison for a road rage attack on a middle-aged woman whom he had tried to run over. The remainder of his crew all had petty records too, They were now too well known to act with impunity. The Shahid brothers elected to move to the west end of Glasgow, but they never forgot about Pollock Shields. The Asian youths on the street knew they still answered to Baldy, no matter where he lived and despite how rarely he showed face in the area. Many of the white youths in the area were equally happy to see Baldy leave. His stranglehold didn't just extend to the Asian youth, it was over the entire general population of Pollock Shields. Even those involved in the white youth gangs and their associates feared him, whether they liked to admit it or not. Even in his mid-twenties and at twice their age and size, he would think nothing of putting out and acting on threats made against them. There was little protection to be had from Baldy and Pollock Shields, When Baldy's face hadn't been seen in weeks, that was something to be, if not celebrated, at least enjoyed. That had been the case for quite a significant period until James Wallace and Chris Donald elected to leave Chris's house and walk down McCulloch Street on March 15, 2004. The pair had just purchased a new video game and were heading home to go and play it. They had smoked a cannabis joint as they walked. Their enjoyment was cut short by the sight of a crew in a silver Mercedes. Zishan Crazy Shahid was driving and Danish Zahid was in the front passenger seat. They couldn't make the remaining passengers out, but the looks they had received from those in the car seemed full of evil intent. They quickly crossed over to the bowling green on Kenmuir Street, unsettled. Baldy, sat in the rear of the vehicle, said to his cronies, quote, I'm doing them, and the car stopped. I'm Jess, and this is Skinwalker. Chris Donald was born on July 2, 1988, in Glasgow, to Angela Donald and Alex McDermott. 
His mother Angela was a kind and caring woman who doted on her son, his father, a dock worker who loved his son dearly. Upon the demise of his relationship with Angela, Alex moved down south to Portsmouth, England to take a job on the docks which kept him away from his young son in Glasgow. Chris had an older sister named Samantha and the pair were described as inseparable. He also had two further sisters, twins Amber and Taylor, and a younger brother Laurie. The family also had a pet dog named Jack, of which Chris was particularly fond. Chris grew up in a Pollock Shields divided by race and ethnicity. It was tough at times, delicately balancing keeping the white gang sufficiently happy that you were on their side while not gaining a reputation as someone whom the Asian gang felt was a threat, which required handling. Mostly, Chris had played this role well. He was a quiet and popular boy who loved playing games on his computer while balancing his academic duties as a pupil at Bella Houston Academy. He was known to bunk off school sometimes. Playing truant meant he could spend more time with his computer games or getting up to minor mischief and smoking cannabis with his friend, James Wallace. The pair weren't hardened criminals. Chris didn't have any criminal record to speak of. Anything they ever got up to was just silly hijinks and the bravado of youth. Nothing like the knife and baseball bat attacks, directed threats and beatings dished out by the two rival gangs in Pollock Shields anyway. Chris was never the biggest or the strongest. In 2004, at 15 years old, he stood only 5 feet 7 inches tall, 9 stone in weight, with his small stature offset with the size of his infectious broad grin. He had a mop of dark hair and bright eyes. Workers at a local youth club, which Chris frequented, stated that he was quiet and friendly. When trouble broke out, as it invariably did at the club, he edged out the way and kept himself to himself. At the same time in early 2004, Chris would have noticed, as all the local boys had, that tensions were rising. The white and Asian gangs were clashing more frequently and the area felt dangerous. Baldy's gang were rampant. Buoyed by the release of Baldy after his road rage attack, Chris had kept out of it, but all it took was looking at someone from the wrong side the wrong way. He continued with his balancing act. He tried to toe the line of just seeming rugged enough that he wasn't a target, and just quiet and friendly enough that he wasn't going to get himself in any trouble. Life was tough for young men in Pollock Shields, no matter your creed or colour. On the 14th of March 2004, some of the local tension in Pollock Shields reached a flashpoint in the city centre. A few of the local boys from the White Gang, dubbed by Imran Shahid as the McCulloch Street Boys, due to the area where most of them milled around in their free time, had seen Baldy and his crew on a night out at a nightclub in the city centre. Conflicting reports designate this as either Victoria's nightclub or Blanket both of which are on Sucky Hall Street. They weren't going to take him on face on. He was a man mountain and loved nothing more than a fight. But they were going to let him know he was a target for violence. Among the team who were sizing up Baldy and his shielders gang were Barry O'Neill, James Farron and James Wishart. All young men in their late teens and early twenties. During a shouting altercation between the two gangs, a bottle was thrown by the McCulloch Street boys at Baldy. Whether the bottle hit him is unclear, but in the aftermath, he gave chase to the three men. They took to their heels and Baldy, carrying his 16 stone physique, was unable to catch them. Swearing his revenge, he abandoned chase. The next day, March 15, 2004, 
Baldy returned to Pollock Shields. His friend, a convicted criminal named Mohammed Faisal Mushtaq, nicknamed Bex, had a flat at 1116 Heriot Street and it formed an ideal base for what Baldy had in mind. Described by one journalist as a council of revenge, Baldy informed the remainder of his crew they were to come to Heriot Street immediately. While he was waiting for the arrival of Zishan Crazy Zahid, Zahid Ziggy Mohammed, and Danish Zahid, he made phone calls to his connections across Pollock Shields and the south side of Glasgow to try and find out the identity of the McCulloch Street boys he had the altercation with the previous evening. Upon the arrival of the remaining gang members, the Shielders set their plan into action. Baldy knew his bright blonde hair would be an easily identifiable marker for any witnesses to the violence he had in mind and tasked his crew with dyeing his hair back to its standard colour. Next, he demanded weaponry, for which his team were only too willing to oblige him. They loaded screwdrivers, a hammer and a sharpened knife into a blue plastic bag. At this point, Baldy intimated to his crew that he intended to quote, chop up the people he believed to be responsible. Mushtaq then waited in the house with the weaponry, while the remainder of the group travelled to the West End to pick up a stolen Mercedes. The car was silver, bearing the registration number Y541VNS. It had been stolen from Lorry Place in Motherwell back in February of 2004 and had been sporadically sighted throughout the city since. The gang returned to Pollock Shields with the vehicle, whereby Bex Mushtak joined the crew, carrying the blue bag of weaponry from the Heriot Street flat. The crew circled aimlessly around McCulloch Street and the rest of Pollock Shields, looking for anyone they could link to the attack from the previous night. Eventually, just after 3pm, the vehicle spotted two youths at the junction between McCulloch Street and Kenmuir Street. The pair sighted were James Wallace and Chris Donald. They weren't players. They had perhaps got involved in some petty stuff in the past, but they weren't known gang members. However, they had grown up around McCulloch Street and knew the white boys around Pollock Shields, and that, for Baldy and his crew at least, was enough. Baldy told his crew to stop, let him out, then continue driving. Once they had gone a distance down the street, they were to double back and come back for him. Baldy rounded on the young pair, first attempting to strike James Wallace. He then grabbed Chris by his jacket, a thick Bergos Hill walking jacket. Chris immediately tried to defend himself. He began to punch the hulking figure holding his coat. His friend James too sprung to his defence. The pair combined weighed around the same as Imran Baldi Shahid and it showed. The pair were being overpowered by the brute strength of the man when three cars pulled close to the scene. Two vehicles of gang associates blocked the pair's escape and the third the Mercedes driven by Zishan Crazy Shahid opened its rear doors to the street. Baldy attempted to bundle both James and Chris into the car. James luckily escaped. Chris, meanwhile, was desperately fighting against the group. A tiny figure of resistance set against grown men. He anchored his feet against the frame of the car and screamed that he was only 15. Baldy Shahid rammed his huge fist repeatedly into Chris's face while forcing him into the car with his knee pressed firmly into Chris's back. As they finally forced Chris inside the vehicle, Baldy turned to James and said, quote, You are next. You don't know what pain feels like. Desperate to save face, James retorted, Come ahead. A common Glasgow phrase daring the other party to make the first move in an attack. As the assailants jumped into the car in which Chris was being held, they shouted, White bastard, 
out of the window at James Wallace. As the vehicle pulled away, witnesses heard someone within the car screaming, Drive! Drive! James Wallace was stood at the side of the road, screaming for help. He was underneath the window of his grandmother's house, and she had witnessed almost the entire event. She was halfway down her tenement staircase by the time that the Mercedes containing Chris was pulling out of the street at a breakneck pace. One local, who was friends with Chris's mum Angela, had the incredibly heartrending task of informing her that her son had been kidnapped. It was unfortunately just the beginning of Angela Donald's heartbreak as the call to report the crime was made to Strathclyde Police at 3.28pm. Chris, now in the footwell of the Mercedes driven by Crazy Shahid, was being continuously attacked by Baldy. Baldy was demanding to know the names of those involved in the nightclub attack the night previous. Chris was told in between barrages of punches and forceful questioning, quote, I'm Baldy, nobody fucks with me. A knife was wedged and twisted against Chris's back and the blue bag was shown to him the bulging outline of which the gang informed him was a gun. Terrified, and with no answers to give, Chris sat at the mercy of the group begging for his freedom. They made multiple phone calls to criminal associates, looking for a location to take Chris to torture him for information. Numerous requests were made, however, their criminal associates were unwilling to offer an address for the torture to take place. Zahid Ziggy Mohammed was then let out of the vehicle at Strathclyde Country Park at around 4pm as he required to be home by 6pm so that he did not set off his electronic tag which was monitoring his court-imposed curfew for knife and road traffic offences. He jumped in a taxi and returned to Pollock Shields. The group then, judging by the cell site analysis of their mobile phones, drove across central Scotland, going from Strathclyde Park up to Dundee, nearly 100 miles outside of Glasgow, then back to Glasgow, as their efforts to sort an address failed. Chris listened in horrified silence to the plans being made for him as he sat powerless in the back of the car. The gang stopped during this period to pick up a canister of petrol. By 7pm, the gang had exhausted all of their options. One final call led a criminal associate to suggest they use the Clyde walkway, a then secluded pathway which runs alongside a stretch of the River Clyde in Glasgow. The walkway is nearby to Celtic Park, the home of one of the city's largest sports teams in the East End. The gang arrived at the location somewhere between 7.15pm and 7.45pm. The sky was dark and visibility was low within the area and the gang decided this was where they would execute their plans. Chris was dragged from the Mercedes by the group and stabbed in both his front and back a total of 13 times. He suffered major organ damage and several major arteries were pierced. Chris was likely restrained by the gang throughout the attack as there was no evidence of him having tried to defend himself against the blows. Chris, by now losing substantial volumes of blood, slumped onto a felled tree trunk next to where the attack took place. As he curled up against the trunk, he felt a harsh sting against his wounds and liquid running over his hair and face. He opened his dying eyes to see the sight of the shoulders, pouring the canister of petrol over his prone body. Callously, they flicked a lit match in his direction and strolled back to their stolen Mercedes. Chris attempted to regain his feet as the fire engulfed his clothes and skin. He frantically rolled in a puddle of mud nearby to the tree trunk, which had been his only source of comfort to try and stem the flames. Chris Donald, only 15, bled to death in a shallow, muddy grave. His clothes burned to cinders and his skin covered in petroleum-fueled burns 
where he lay until the discovery of his body the following morning. Just after 8pm, Strathclyde Police received another call related to the case. Several witnesses had called in to state they had seen a vehicle on fire at the Granby Lane lock-up garages in the west end of Glasgow. The fire service attended and quenched the flames which engulfed the car. The police made initial notes that the car was not displaying registration plates. After dumping the vehicle sometime before 8pm, the Shielders gang returned to the Heriot Street flat of Beck's Mushtack, where neighbours heard animated phone calls taking place throughout the night. A witness, subject to the rule of terror with which the Shielders controlled Pollock Shields, later recalled that on the evening of March 15, 2004, they were instructed to bring a canister of petrol to the flat. When he arrived, he was told to take a black bin bag of clothing given to him by Zishan Crazy Shahid and burn it in a local lane. He followed his orders. In the aftermath of the murder, at some point in March of 2004, Imran Baldi Shahid, Zishan Crazy Shahid and Mohammed Faisal Bex Mushtaq first headed south to England, then boarded flights for Pakistan, their family's country of heritage, which held no extradition treaties and a reputation for somewhat hostile negotiations with the United Kingdom. The body of Chris Donald was found the following morning by a passing cyclist on the Clyde walkway. Calls were placed to the command centre at Strathclyde Police and Detective Superintendent Elliot McKenzie was appointed to lead the investigation. The investigative team on site were quickly met with a few horrifying realisations. Bloodstains and scotches on the body, dirt track and the logs indicated Chris Donald had been alive and mobile as he had been set alight. He had been assaulted at the top of the slope and made his way down the hill as he died in abject agony. The same investigating forensic scientist Pauline McSorley was tasked with searching the burned out Mercedes once it was made safe and discovered blood spotting and a trainer which matched that of those recovered at the scene. Both belonged to Chris Donald. A leather jacket owned by Imran Baldi Shahid was also recovered. Strathclyde police were also tasked with informing Chris's family. His doting mother Angela, sick with fright over the reports of abduction the day previously, had now been informed her son had died in the most tragic of circumstances. The investigation into the circumstances behind the murder of Chris Donald began fervently. It did not take the team long to establish a link with the abduction reports of the previous day and the discovery of Chris's body on March 16, 2004. The rumours on the street and the interviews conducted quickly led police to know this was in some fashion related to the escalating tensions between the boys of white heritage and boys of Asian heritage in the area. As such, extra patrols had been scheduled within the area alongside the investigation. There were initial leads followed in the inquiry that Chris's murder may have been an honour killing. A number of national newspaper publications ran stories that it may have been related to James Wallace's relationship with a woman of African heritage from the area named Angelica Mabelo who was then aged 17. James publicly addressed this and mentioned it was untrue, as he had only been seeing Angelica for a few weeks and she did not come from a background which would have led to an honour killing. The pressure on Angelica, who it later transpired, had nothing to do with the entire incident, was so intense that she fled Pollock Shields to her mother's house in Greenock in the aftermath. At the same time, the pathway at which Chris had been discovered had become a shrine to his life which had been tragically cut short. Flowers and football scarves and tops for Glasgow's two main teams, Celtic and Rangers, lined the walkway alongside thoughtful messages from those who knew Chris. 
flowers had been sent from the largest mosque in Glasgow, Glasgow's Central Mosque, expressing the distraught of the Muslim community at large about the crime. His ex-girlfriend Kirsty frequented the spot. Another tribute had popped up to Chris a few hundred metres from his home in Pollock Shields, with a large banner bearing the message, Crypto Lives On, a reference to Chris's nickname. The police were running into dead ends in their investigation. There was a distinct wall of silence throughout Pollock Shields. White locals would state they were victimised by Asian youths, whilst Asian youths noted there were areas which they could not venture into for fear of retribution attacks. When it came to naming names, neither side obliged. The attitude towards police assistance was described as alarming by DS Elliot McKenzie. The six witnesses whom James Wallace mentioned having seen the abduction all refused to provide a written statement in the aftermath. A press conference was also held to appraise the media of the situation and one question dominated the proceedings. Was the murder of Chris Donald race related? The police had attempted to downplay this angle, however, over time it became apparent that this was the case. With no answers publicly forthcoming and the local community becoming ever more agitated, the police's reputation took a further blow. Leaks began to take place which criticised some of the local policing tactics, claiming many of the Asian youths within Pollock Shields acted with impunity, given local officers were scared of being accused of racism in the event of heavy-handed policing. The police began a period of infighting in the media, defending or attacking their tactics depending on where they sat on the issue, rather than focusing on the most important aspect of the investigation, finding and charging the murderers of Chris Donald. By March 19th, Imran Baldi Shahid's name began to be linked with the crime in the media, if not as a participant in the violence, as a commanding officer of the gang, likely to have carried out the attack. At the same date, the police made a statement to note that they knew the street nicknames of those involved in the attacks and it was only a matter of time before they were in a position to seize those responsible and bring them to justice. The police were not to know that three of the main culprits were already safely in Pakistan, protected by the lack of extradition treaty. Angela Donald also used the same article to make a public plea not to make this a case about escalating racial tensions, but instead to focus on arresting the people responsible, irrespective of their creed or colour. By March 20, 2004, the British National Party, a political organisation often accused of being racist, focused on the promotion of so-called British values, had intimated their wish to turn Pollock Shields into a political and racial battleground to promote the interests of the white citizens within the area. There was significant pushback on the BNP's plans, both at a political level and from the people of Glasgow and Pollock Shields. Whatever problems Pollock Shields may have had, or the issues and challenges the communities may have been facing, they did not need whatever it was which the BNP were selling. The case slowly drifted out of headlines until the police had a breakthrough on April 2, 2004. Two and a half weeks after Chris's brutal murder, the police issued three arrest warrants. Danish Zahid and Zahid Mohammed were two of these warrants. The third person indicated remains unclear, however, given Imran Baldi Shahid, Zishan Crazy Shahid and Bex Mushtaq were by now in Pakistan, it is likely to have been one of the three. Danish Zahid was charged with murder, while Zahid Mohammed was charged with abduction and murder, both in relation to the murder of Chris Donald. When trying to bring the remaining members of the gang to justice, Strathclyde police realised the group had likely escaped to Pakistan. Given no extradition treaties existed between the UK and Pakistan, the thought of bringing the remainder to justice seemed unlikely. Once the police had conducted all investigations on the body, 
Angela Donald was able to lay Chris to rest within the Lynn Cemetery on Glasgow's south side. Scotland's first Muslim MP, Mohammed Sarwar of Glasgow Central, promised to do his utmost to repatriate the men and to ensure they face justice. Despite Mohammed Sarwar's good intentions, the prospect of bringing the remainder of the gang back to face trial at any close juncture seemed remote. As such, the Procurator Fiscal, Scotland's public prosecutor for criminal cases, brought trials forward for the two members of the gang which they currently had in custody. Zahid Mohammed almost immediately offered to turn Crown witness and assist in prosecuting the remainder of the gang members. Due to his participation in this and the fact he had not been at the scene of the murder due to returning home to prevent his electronic tag being set off, the Procurator Fiscal reduced the charges Zahid Mohammed was facing to merely that of abduction. During the trial, Zahid Mohammed spilt the inner secrets of the attack and about what certain gang members promised to do. He admitted he knew there was a possibility Chris would be stabbed as the party who was referred to during the trial as X, later found out to be Imran Shahid, had insinuated he would do so. He also stated that he did not know Chris Donald and did not believe him to be involved in gang activity. He had been white and in the wrong place at the wrong time. Zahid Mohammed was given five years imprisonment for his involvement in the abduction. Danish Zahid was sentenced to 17 years for racially motivated murder. The police now knew the parties whom they were seeking, and they knew they were in Pakistan. Any remaining doubts they may have had were entirely obliterated by Zahid Mohammed's testimony. Racial tensions were also at an all-time high. Without the efforts of Mohammed Sarwar and Angela Donald, Pollock Shields may likely have experienced a race war. Sarwar was, it must be said, working at incredible pace and powered entirely only by his own initiative in the aftermath of the crime. By April 2004, he had travelled to Pakistan to speak with President Pervez Musharraf about the potential powder keg situation which the incident could ignite within Glasgow between the Asian and white communities. President Musharraf agreed with Sarwar and promised to assist. However, despite the assurances of the President and his number two, Shokat Aziz, promising a no-strings-attached extradition, the case became a game of political cat and mouse over the following year. There were offers of trading prisoners from Pakistan, then a request from the Home Office to prevent this one-and-done extradition approach, as it may damage their long-term goal of achieving a more complete extradition treaty with Pakistan. In December of 2004, a long-lasting community effort resulted in the installation of a number of CCTV cameras across Pollock Shields to help minimise the risk of such an event reoccurring. In May of 2005, Mohammed Sarwar finally directed his approach to the correct person. Meeting with Pakistani dignitaries in London, he approached Aftab Shapayo, an interior cabinet minister within Pakistan. Sherpayo proved to be the critical link. Focusing the authorities and joining the resources of Strathclyde Police and those in Lahore, he was able to deliver Imran Shahid to custody within a matter of weeks. Shahid had continued his criminal endeavours in Pakistan and was found living under the assumed identity of Enrique Soprano, a nod to the Mafia Don with whom Baldi Shahid believed he shared a common image. Shahid was not resolute under interrogation. He quickly revealed the location of the remaining two and by late summer of 2005, over a year after the attack, all three men were in custody, awaiting repatriation to the United Kingdom. Mohammed Sarwar's one-man army approach to bringing Chris's remaining attackers to justice had been a success. 
the trio were flown back to the United Kingdom in October of 2005 in manacles and guarded by 11 of Strathclyde Police's finest, including the initial head of the investigation, DS Elliot McKenzie. They were strip searched before entry, where it was found that most were bearing contraband, which they had removed. The gang appeared unfazed by the flight or the fate which awaited them in the United Kingdom. Their position was drawn into sharp relief when taxi drivers at Glasgow Airport parked around the security office and angrily voiced what the people of Glasgow made of them. A significant security escort was required to ensure their safety as they were transferred to the care of the prison service to be held on remand until trial. Their trial did not commence for nearly a year, whereby it began on October 2, 2005. The trial culminated in three convictions for racially motivated murder on November 8, 2006 at the High Court in Edinburgh. The convictions of Danish Zahid, Imran Shahid, Zishan Shahid and Mohammed Mushtaq was the first instance within the United Kingdom of racially motivated murder being proven against anyone from an ethnic minority background against a white victim. The evidence was overwhelming, with a number of witnesses and experts coming forward to see justice done, including a number from the Asian community of Pollock Shields. Once again, Zahid Mohammed was a key witness for the prosecution. Upon sentencing, Lord Uist made the following statement. You have all been convicted by the jury of the racially aggravated abduction and murder of Chris Donald, a wholly innocent 15-year-old boy of slight build. He was selected as your victim only because he was white and walking in a certain part of the Pollock Shields area of Glasgow when you sought out a victim. This murder consisted of the premeditated, cold-blooded execution of your victim by stabbing him 13 times and setting him alight with petrol while he was still in life. It truly was an abomination. The savage and barbaric nature of this crime has rightly shocked and appalled the public. Your victim must have been in a state of extreme terror while held by you during a four hour car journey across central Scotland and back. And the agony which he must have suffered during the period between being stabbed and set alight and his death is just beyond imagining. None of you has shown any remorse for what you could have done. The sentence for murder is fixed by law and I am about to pronounce that sentence on each of you separately. As the verdicts were read out, Chris's mother Angela, grief-stricken, called out, You bastards. The reprehensible gang were sentenced to 25, 22 and 23 years respectively. In the midst of the investigation into Chris's murder, James Wallace Jr, who was with Chris when his abduction took place, and James Wallace Sr were both arrested for a racially aggravated assault on Nazir Saeed, cousin of Danish Saeed, who had been involved in Chris's murder. The case collapsed on the first day of the trial in December 2004, after none of the alleged witnesses turned up to testify. As such, the case against the pair was dropped. The currently imprisoned Shielders gang have made repeated attempts throughout the intervening years to either minimise their sentence or improve their conditions of imprisonment. The gang lived in intense fear of reprisal attacks in prison as numerous gangland figures had made it clear since their being held on remand in 2005 that given the opportunity, they would exact revenge upon the group. Imran Baldi Shahid was attacked and threatened within Berlini Prison in Glasgow, to which the authorities responded by holding him in a single occupancy cell. Imran Shahid, along with Zishan Crazy Shahid, claimed this was in breach of their human rights in 2011. Imran Shahid pursued this again individually in 2014. Both claims were denied by the courts. Shahid was ultimately successful in arguing this position separately in 2015 
However, he was afforded no compensation for his successful claim. Imran Shahid was also attacked in Her Majesty's prison Kilmarnock, whereby a fellow prisoner, William Crawford, attacked him with a barbell. Shahid suffered a fractured jaw and cheekbone, shattered teeth and cuts, bruises and swelling to his face and head. He recovered and has since been involved in a number of prison violence incidents himself involving injuring other prisoners. One of the cases brought by Imran Shahid involved arguing for the reinstitution of items that the prison service had removed from him, including his penis pump for erectile dysfunction and his Xbox, which he argued were necessary for his health. The case was summarily dismissed. One of the more outlandish claims which appeared to have some evidence to support it was the mitigating circumstances which Danish Zahid put to the courts. He argued that he had put a record in his phone at the time of text, then stored the phone behind a wall in his parents' house in the event that he was murdered. He felt he could have been murdered by a family he had accused of being the real masterminds behind the crime. The family comprised of two main brothers, who were not the Shahids, but part of a family called the Akrams. He stated that he had hidden his phone in a wall cavity within his parents' house to be given as evidence of his lack of complicity should he be arrested for the murder. Taken together, these texts read as follows. This is Danish Zahid. If I have been murdered, I was murdered by Shafiq Akram, Shahid Akram, Zahid Muhammad and Liaqat Khan. I was murdered because I drove the car against my will when Shafiq Akram kidnapped and murdered Chris Donald and Ziggy stabbed him in the back. They murdered Chris because Jamie Wallace stabbed Shafiq last week. Leocat only helped kidnap Chris and said he was going to say he was in a mental hospital if questioned by the police. But this is a lie as he knew exactly what he was doing. Shafiq and Shahid Akram threatened to kill me 20 minutes ago and I believed them because I saw them kill Chris two and a half hours ago. Some two weeks later, on March 31, 2004, notwithstanding the allegedly severe threats made to him by the brothers, Danish Zahid further stated that he had given a statement to police officers investigating the murder. In the course of that statement, he claimed to have been working in his family's shop on the day of the murder. He then went on, however, to describe how there had recently been a lot of trouble between Asian and white boys in the vicinity of McCulloch Street. In particular, how white boys had some problems with the brothers and how one of the brothers had apparently been stabbed and injured a couple of days before the murder. He argued this was helpful in progressing the investigation and gave further proof of the mitigation which his defence counsel was presenting. As such, when taken with the alleged messages on his mobile phone showed he was not a leading party in the murder of Chris Donald but had been in effect coerced. However, under scrutiny, it turned out that the vast majority of his testimony was a fabrication. The story of the phone in the wall cavity was proven impossible on several counts. The critical piece of evidence which sunk Danish Zahid's story was that the phone, rather than being hidden in a wall cavity for four years as described in his testimony, was proven to have been in regular use from his sister from the time of the attack on Chris Donald through to the time that it was brought forth as evidence of his coercion. Similarly, Danish Zahid had admitted to not being aware of Chris Donald, yet had somehow managed to spell his name with the double S within his messages. The evidence, according to the expert witness, had been deliberately manufactured on the phone and as such, he drew a result of fabrication for the entirety of Danish Zahid's testimony in this regard. All parties, except for Crown Witness Zahid Muhammad, remain in custody to this day. In 2007, Glasgow band Glass Vegas released a track called Flowers and Football Tops, which the band were inspired to write as a result of seeing the visible images of grief left for Chris resonating in such a painful way. The lyrics 
written from the perspective of a grieving mother in the aftermath of such an event begin. Baby, why are you not home yet? Baby, it's getting late. I wish you would be home by now. Doorbell rings. Who could it be at this time? Police on my left and right. My son's not coming home tonight. Baby, they don't need to show. It's over. I know, I know. Baby, they don't need to show. Flowers and football tops. I know. Baby. 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 Why you? <laughs>